Thank you so much for joining us online today. You can continue to help us bring messages just like this one by going to anchorpoint.tv slash give. I hope this message encourages you today and helps you grow on your journey with Jesus. Now let's dive in. If you got your Bibles today, we're going to be in John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Uh, we are in part number 11. I never thought I would ever say that, but we're in part number 11 of this series called Eyes on Jesus. Everybody say that title with me. One, two, three, Eyes on Jesus. And man, Jesus is the most transcendent figure in all of human history. I mean, his birth split time in two. And every time you write the date on something, you are declaring that something happened in Bethlehem. Uh, no matter what you believe about what happened in Bethlehem, you are declaring that something happened uh, in Bethlehem. And uh, the thing I look at is, man, all world religions, all major world religions have to give an answer for who Jesus was and what Jesus did. And if you hear, ever hear anybody tell you all religions are the same, no, they're not. That's just an uneducated statement. Every major world religion, religion has to have a statement on what to do with Jesus and if it's me, I want to find the common denominator of what everybody's trying to say and find out as much as I can know about that man. So we have spent 11 weeks looking at excerpts from the life of Jesus. And man, I've been preaching some texts I haven't preached uh, ever or in a long time, and it's been fun. This thing started uh, 11 weeks ago. The writer of Hebrews uh, saying, hey, you need to run your race and fix your eyes on Jesus. That's where we're Hebrews 12. We're, run your race. Don't run other people's race. Don't look to other people's race. Run your race and keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't get distracted by all the things going on in culture. Run your race and keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't, no, no, no. Don't get caught up in what's on your TV and what's on your Facebook feed. No, you run your race and keep your, say it with me, one, two, three, eyes on Jesus. So today we're in John chapter five. I haven't preached this text since I was a youth pastor and, and really felt like this is where we needed to be today. Let me kind of set the scene and I'll read the text and we'll make a couple comments. I'm going to try to teach a little bit more than yell and scream today uh, and just let the Lord kind of lead us in that area. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. We'll read that in the first verse of the text. He, he is headed up for some festivals. And, and what we're going to begin to see in this text is Jesus is creating conflict between his kingdom and the Jewish leader's authority. In, in fact, he's going to heal a man. He's going to heal a man on the Sabbath. He does that a lot in the Gospel of John. And it's really just demonstrating as he creates the conflict with the Jewish leader leaders that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, if I zoomed out from that statement, he's the Lord of the Sabbath, what Jesus is doing in the gospel of John often is letting us know that rules don't produce righteousness. That's why we need grace. And I don't know about you. I'm thankful for grace. I'm God gave me grace because I've never been a good rule keeper. Come on and say, amen. All the 11 a.m. We ain't rule keepers. That's why we're here late. All right. We like to sleep in. All right. And, and Jesus said, hey, I did and that's kind of the overarching picture. Uh, let's read the text and kind of see where uh, we, we want to go today. Here's what it says, verse number one of chapter five, book of John. Sometime later, Jesus went up to, to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there was in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida. And, and, and on that, in that town, there was a, a, a surrounded by five colonnades, uh, a pool surrounded by five colonnades. Here a great number of disabled used to lie, the blind, the, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Verse number four. Now, if you got an NIV, I want to show you something real quick. If you got an NIV or ESV or NLT, like most modern translations, you're like, where's my verse four? My verse four ain't there. And if you, the only Bibles I know of, I think that still have verse four in it is King James and New King James. Now, uh, if you have one of those, you're going to read verse four. Now, if you have an NIV like me, which is our preferred translation, um, you, you, you see a little footnote. My, like mine has a little B beside it, and then it takes me down here. So all the people saying, they, did, they deleted verses from the Bible. They didn't delete them. It relegated it to a footnote for a reason. Okay, And so I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but I do want to let you know why that is. There is a discrepancy in the manuscript evidence. And the NIV and the NASB were translated much later than the King James, and we simply had more manuscripts than they had. In fact, we had earlier earlier manuscripts than they had. So the NIV committee believes that what we're about to read is, is a scribal ad, which means it was added 
after the fact. Now, it doesn't change the meaning of the text. I do, however, disagree with the NIV, and I'll show you why I disagree, and I think the verse should be in here. But verse number four says this, if you go down to your footnote in your modern translation, it would say, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. Uh, the first one in the pool, when the waters were stirred, is such a disturbance, will be cured of whatever disease they had. Verse number Five says this, one who had been there, an invalid, for 38 years. There was one there for 38 years. When uh, Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition a long time. Everybody say long time. One, two, three, long time. He asked, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. So here's why I believe that verse probably should be added because it gives context that there is something that stirs the water and there are people to get healed when it goes in. Now, if you want to debate this and talk about it in the lobby, I'd love to. If you're a Bible nerd, I'm a Bible nerd. I can tell you why it was stirred. I can tell you I did a lot of research on it. All right, it was interesting. I can tell you what they think it was and what it really was. But anyway, so we can talk about there, you know, uh, in the lobby. Uh, while I'm trying to get in, someone goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat. And at once the man was cured, and he picked up his mat and walked. I want to use for a title today, I would if I could. I would if I could. Anybody got any pet peeves? Anybody got a pet peeves? I, I, got some, I got some pet peeves. I jotted down a few, kind of see if I can set up the sermon like this. A lot of you know a few of my pet peeves. I, I, one of my pet peeves is people who shop in stores but can't count the number of items in their basket based on the lane that they should get in. Now, this is called, I'm a rule follower. I'm a rule follower. I just do what the rules say. Some of you are not rule followers and everybody hates you. But other than that, other than that, it's fine. It's other than that. So that, that's a little pet peeve. I don't like slow drivers. That's a pet peeve. I don't like slow drivers. I get a little frustrated with slow drivers. Y'all know this. But, but I jotted down a few others you might not know about me, just kind of get to know me a little bit. I don't like gum smackers and loud chewers. I don't Shut up! But you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like, here, here's another one I, I jot down. I don't like movie talkers. Oh, I can't watch a movie with a movie talker. Who is he? What is he doing? I'm watching it with you. How do I know? My wife's the worst, and it's even at home. If she missed the first five minutes, she's got questions for the next 50 minutes. What's his name? Why is he mad? I don't know. He's good guy. He's bad guy. All the show's in the same. But I think one of my biggest pet peeves are the people who buy old police cars at the police surplus auction and leave the light on the side of it. Come on, somebody. We about to speak in tongues this morning. Amen, I'm preaching. Yeah. Can't stand that, because y'all know, y'all know. I got, I'm telling you, we were coming down 59 the other day. I got behind what I thought was a police car. had a little light, had a blue tag. And I'm telling you, it's like the 59 pace car. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like nobody's going to pass him. And like, man, like eight miles of traffic. And then finally, this one dude pulls up beside him, kind of drives even with, even with him. I was like, oh. And then I was like, get him, get him. Because you know how when you speed, you want grace. But when somebody else speeds, they need justice, right? Anyway, that's a different sermon. We ain't preaching about your bitterness. But anyway, <laughs> and then somebody else pulled up. And I'm like, these people, it's crazy. They about to, yeah, and after about the 10th car, I'm like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm, pulled up beside this dude, look over, dude, 87 years old. Oh, man, I was like, may the flies of a thousand camels infest that car in Jesus' name. <laughs> pet peeves. Man, I have a huge pet peeve when somebody tells me to do something that I would if I could. Has anyone ever told you to do something? You're like, thanks, Diane. I appreciate that. I'll take that under consideration. I would if I I could. I was talking the other night. I was talking with my wife and then was thinking about something. She knows I've been thinking about it for a couple of days. And, and then and, and she she's has a little bit more of the male tendencies in our relationship when it comes to emotional things. She, she doesn't have emotions. <laughs> and, and she's like, just stop thinking about it. I would if I could. Because it'd be like me telling you, don't think about a yellow school bus. 
Whatever you do right now, do not picture a yellow school bus. Do not think about the yellow school bus. If you rode the school bus when you were a kid, do not think about the school bus pulling up to your house and those air brakes. Do not think about a yellow school bus. Do not think about the doo-doo brown seats in the yellow school bus. Do not. And what are you? You're like, and I'm like, stop it. Stop. Stop thinking about it. You're like, okay. Oh, if you, I can't, I would if I could. And I grew up in the in the can't never could generation. How many of you ever heard that one? Can't never could. That's horrible. Horrible grammar, all right? Can't never. I grew up. You couldn't even say you couldn't do something. I mean, well, I mean, who remembers R. Kelly and Space Jam? Come on, somebody. If you believe it, you can achieve it. <laughs> liar, liar. That's inspirational, but it is not biblical. In fact, there are things that are outside of your ability. We all have, let's say it like this, we all have a limitation. They all have limitations you're going to bump up on. Everybody in this room has had an I would if I could moment in your life. I would if I could. Somebody said, you should just stop worrying about that. Thanks, Bob. I would if I could. You should stop being afraid of that. I would if I could. Well, just don't be depressed. That's not how any of this works. I would if I could. I would if I could. Stop lusting after Oreo cookie donuts. I, I, I would if I could. But Krispy Kreme, hey, it's, I would if I could. In fact, I think the tension is there's many things that we need to do and should do, but they are simply outside of our ability. Now, I'm not going to let you off the hook because some of them are not outside of your ability. They're outside of your discipline. All right? So don't be taking my sermon and saying, I can't do nothing. Now, some of them are out, not outside of your ability. They're outside of your level of commitment. But there are things that are outside of our level of ability. Let me say it like this. We are limited people. We all have the limitation. But we are limited people who serve an unlimited God. And that's the image I want you to get in your head today, that many times we discount the power of God in our life. And many times we discount the ability of God to work in us and flow through us, that many times we under, got to understand that the God that we sing songs to is the God who spoke the world into his existence when he said, let there be light flung forth in planets. And everything that we see that is made was made in the moment, in the matter of, of, of a millisecond by the power and the creative word of our God. He is all powerful. Come on, if you're with me, say amen. So we got to understand that we are limited. He is powerful. So how does this work? I do what is doable, and I trust him with what is impossible. And that's where I want to kind of dive off. I'm going to give you three things from this text in three different categories, kind of work in categories today. They're in points. Jot them down. Number one is this. Number one, you can be in need but not unnoticed. You can be in need but not unnoticed. When you are in need, it is easy to feel unnoticed. When you are in need, it's easy to feel unseen. When you are in need, it's easy to feel invisible. When you're the one in need, you can actually be all up in your own feelings. When you're in need, you can be insecure. When, when you're in need, you can feel inadequate. In fact, it's amazing that when you're the one in need, you're blown away by how many people don't know that you're in need. Although when you're not the one in need, you are oblivious to the people that are in need around you. I see it in church world all the time. You'll miss a couple Sundays and people get mad at the church, which I always think is funny that people are mad at a building. Uh, they get mad at the church. Whether it's people and, you know, you know, get mad. Nobody checked on me. Nobody. How many people you check on this week? You been checking on people? Oh, no, you were busy. You were busy. Oh, okay, 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 okay. You know, some people go, well, I went in and got a cup of coffee at that church, and, you know, since they got this new church, they don't, nobody talk to me. Anybody talk, you talk to anybody today? You say hello to anybody? Because when you're in need, you are aware of your vulnerabilities. When you are in need, you often feel unnoticed, but I want you to see that you are not unnoticed. Notice, look at verse number three, read the underlying words with me. Here at this pool of Bethsaida, 
he said this, a great, say it with me, a great number of disabled people used to lie. Come on, everybody say it with me, a great what? A great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Look at verse number five. What did Jesus say? One, one. So there's a great number, and then there's one who was there, had been an invalid for 38 years. Jesus has a knack for finding the one. I, I, love, that, I love that Jesus doesn't avoid the poor. I probably would have avoided the pool. I probably wouldn't have went where all the need was because Jesus walks into a place that other people walked around. Man, I need to be more like Jesus. I, I, I really do because like last week we talked about Jesus in the garden. And I, I didn't get to it because we get, God started moving. We was preaching. God's, but it, it, he, he came back after prayer, and Jesus looked at the disciples, and he said, get up. You know, I was going, get up, get up, get up. You know, and, but he said that the last part of that verse says, get up so that you can pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And it was just amazing to me that was when Jesus was under the most pressure he had ever felt uh, in his life, that, that in that moment, Jesus was concerned about the disciples, that Jesus in his most dire circumstances had the wherewithal to have a focus on others. And here I am confessing to you that I can't handle when my people with my own last name smack their gum. I need to be more like Jesus because I want to smack them in the head. You know, <laughs> Jesus is about to die on the cross for the sins of humanity. And he's like, disciples, I'm worried about you. I want to murder people when I go to Walmart. Come on, somebody. I need to be more like Jesus. I need to be more like my Savior. The thing is, when we feel unnoticed, we will often seek an acknowledgement from anywhere. When you feel unnoticed, you will start to seek acknowledgement from anywhere. And that's, I've had people come to me and like, Pastor, why aren't you on social media? I had one guy a couple months ago, he was like, Pastor, I think you should be more active on social media. I'm like, I don't even like it, all right? I, I, I'm going to try. I could try. But here's what I do. I don't, I don't need you to know what I ate for me to eat what I want to eat. I don't need you to know that I work out, that I went to work out. I don't need that validation. Because here's the deal. If I seek validation in anything other than God, it leads to contamination. Let me say that one more time. If I see me, and, it, and you could be different, but if I seek validation in anything other than God, it will lead to contamination in my life. It'll contaminate my identity. And, and here's what happens. I start living like someone I'm not. If, you're, if you have a contaminated identity, you'll start faking it. You'll start projecting an image of what you want people to see on the surface, but it's not who you really are on the inside. You'll project what you want everybody to see and think about you, but who you really are has nothing to do with the image people think that's who you are. And that leads to exhaustion, being Fake is exhausting. And putting a level of, uh, of lifehood out in the world on social media for people to say, I need to like that or I need to be like that, but you're miserable on the inside will lead you to be empty. Because validation outside of God always leads to, I'll contaminate my purpose. I'll start living for what I wasn't created for. And I've seen it and you've seen it. People will prostitute their purpose for a payoff. Living for a paycheck, contamination. You'll contaminate your faith. I'm telling you, if you're seeking acknowledgement from anywhere, if you're seeking validation outside of God, you'll have validation from the crowd instead of the cross. You'll find worth in success, but not worth in the Savior. Can we talk today? Jesus has a way of finding the one. I jotted it down like this. Everyone is a one to Jesus. In fact, if you want some extra reading to, to understand that, just go read Luke chapter 15 this week. Luke chapter 15, three parables. Most of you, if you've even been around church any time at all, you'll know the three parables. One is where Jesus tells a parable that a farmer or shepherd had 99 sheep and he loses one. Everyone is a one. Everybody say one. One, two, three. 
one. Everybody is one. And the Bible says the shepherd leads the 99 and goes finds the one. And people oftentimes are like, you, you know, you need to lead 99. And they, Jesus is the good shepherd. I'm just a shepherd, all right? I'm still, he's still working on me. I need to be more like Jesus, okay? Because I can't stand people who buy cop, old cop cars. Anyway, so, so, so you got that one. Then there's a, a parable of the lost coin. There's a lady who has 10 coins. She loses one. And the Bible says that she'll turn her house upside down to find the one. Why? Because everyone is a one to Jesus. Come on, everybody say one. One, two, three, one. There's, then the third parable is the lost son, or what you may know of as the prodigal son. And the father in that story is an image of God. And God has two sons, the story says, two sons, and he loses one. And the father doesn't say, well, I got another one. It's no big deal. No, the, the prodigal son says, hey, I want my money. I want my inheritance. And the Bible says that he goes off and he lives uh, in, in a way that is contrary to the father. But he comes to his senses when he is broke and broken. Don't miss that. He comes to his senses when he is broke and when he is broken. And he says, I'll go back to my father's house. I'll be a servant. I'll be a slave. The Bible says an image of God that God saw his son while he was a long way off. Well, let's me know that God was not consumed with the one he had. He was consumed with the one that is yet to come because everyone is a one to God. What am I saying? I am saying that you are not unnoticed, that you are not insignificant, that the God of heaven attunes his. The reason I preached last week that you should build a routine that involves God is because we are not fighting for God's attention. God is fighting for ours. God is not fighting we are not, we're not fighting. God, we have God's attention that if, if you come to him in prayer and you ask him prayer, that you come boldly before the throne of grace. We are not fighting for God's attention. God is fighting for ours. And one unmistakable theme of the scripture is God sees and God notices and God cares. God can find you anywhere. He found Moses in the backside of the desert in the wilderness. He found David in a pasture. He found Elisha in a farm field. He can find you without internet or GPS or location data. He can find you. Don't worry. Well, you know, he doesn't seem to care. Don't worry. Don't stress. In fact, you didn't find God. God found you anyway. God came to you. When I, I, I get so good. I know what we're saying. Well, I found God. No, you didn't. You were not God's number one draft pick, Bubba. Tell you right now, how many of you know you have done some dumb things in your life? Get your hand up, raise them up online. How many of you know? Get them up, get them up. Yeah, I've done some dumb things. Let me tell you something. God, look past that. That is amazing. God, look past all that. You are not, you're, you're like, you're not that smart. You're not that talented. And even the talented people, God can still use you in spite of all of that, all right? I remember uh, we were in... Uh, being a, I was being a youth pastor, and man, we started to see some level of ministry success as a youth pastor. And I mean, we had over a thousand kids coming on Wednesday night. And uh, I remember the newspaper in our town, they're like, man, what is happening at the youth ministry? And they wanted to do an interview. And I remember, <laughs> I want to do an interview. And I got the picture, I got the newspaper clipping, and I got it in my house, actually. It's in the, it's in the thing, uh, it's in the attic. And me and Pastor Porter were laid up on a pool table, and like, yeah. You know, we got, we doing it, you know, we cool, you know. And um, I remember doing that, that interview, and the next Wednesday night I got up and preached, and nothing happened. And I went back to my office, and I felt like the Lord said, that's what it's like to preach without me. And I said, I don't want to ever feel that way again. See, God doesn't need me. He chooses to use me. You are noticed, but God don't need you, bro. God don't need you, honey. You need him. You're not trying to convince God to get on your side. You need to surrender and come over on God's side and say, God, I need you in my life. You can be in need, but not unnoticed. When I look at this, I just see so many ways that we need to start making sure that we don't live our life by our feelings, but instead live by our faith. And I think the antidote to feeling unnoticed is to truly arm yourself. The antidote to feeling unnoticed is to arm yourself, to know that Hebrews 13 really does say, you got might have to recite it to yourself, that he will never leave me or forsake me. I'm going to arm myself. I'm going to live by faith, not by feeling. I'm going to arm myself with the truth of God. 
God's word. I'm telling you, when you feel unnoticed, it's not gonna, it's not gonna feel like it. It's not gonna feel like it. But you might have to actually lay your eyes on Psalm 23 that says, you know what? Because in the valley, you're gonna feel alone. In the valley, you're gonna feel unnoticed. In the valley, you're gonna feel unseen. But you gotta arm yourself with the truth of his word and say, even in the valley, he is with me. Even in the seasons and the darkness of my life, he is with me. You gotta arm yourself with some Matthew 28, 21 that says, you know what? He is with me to the end of the age. That means as long as this little ball revolves around that big old sun, that the God in heaven is with me, sees me, notices me, knows my name. He called me. He chose me. He gave me a gift. He gave me a future. And he has one for you too. I'm telling you right now, he put you on the planet right now. He put you in your family right now. Why? Because you were made for the moment that you are currently living in. It's the sovereignty of God at work. And I'm telling you, when you get, don't you dare, a devil in hell cannot tear you down when God's ready to raise you up. You are not unnoticed. You're not unnoticed. You're not a number two, number two, number two, jot it down, number two. Helpless, but not hopeless. Helpless, but not hopeless. All of us have felt helpless at some point. We've all hit that limitation factor. And we have all had an, a thing that we come physical, we hit the physical limitation to where there's nothing else to do. And, and if you're a control freak like me, because I'm a control freak, I hate it. Control freaks hate when they're not in control. Come on, control freaks and say amen. amen. You want to have some fun? Put a control freak in an airport. That's fun. <laughs> That's fun. Because we ain't control nothing in an airport. In fact, I walk through the airport now and I have to say things like, I am not a human, I have no rights. I am not a human, I have no rights. And so, um, you are not in control. Uh, um, and, and maybe you don't like the word helpless. I'm never helpless. Uh, let me give you another word. Uh, now, I'm going to show you helpless in the scripture, but let me kind of help our understanding. Uh, think, think the word powerless. Maybe above helpless, write powerless. Uh, powerless. There's, there's things in your life you're powerless, like, like you would if you could, but you're powerless. Watch what happens in our text. Watch what happens in our text. When Jesus saw him, the invalid who had been there 38 years, lying there and learned that his condition, he had been in this condition a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have, come on, everybody say it together like we're in Sunday school, I have what? I have no one to help me. I'm helpless. I have no one to help me. I have no one to help me get in the pool when the water is stirred. When I'm trying to get in, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to get in. Someone else goes down ahead of me. Now, I just want to say, if you're talking to the Son of God, this brother coming in hot. Because he's like, listen, G, it's us. And he's like, no, I'm just kidding, that's cheesy church humor, that's bad. All right. Um, I'm helpless. If, if you didn't notice, I, I, I'm paralyzed, I'm, I'm an invalid. I'm, and I, I'm going to tell you right now, when, when I get to heaven, I, if this dude is, is in heaven, I, I owe him an apology. I'm telling you right now. Because the last time I preached this text was when I was a youth pastor. And here's how I preached the text to the teenagers. Now, you got to understand, I grew up scary church. So don't be judging me now about how I preached the text then. But I thought the brother was making excuses. So I told my... I, I, I told him, some of y'all in this room are full of excuses, and you can't excuse your sin. <laughs> it's bad, people. <laughs> it was me. Your excuses will lead you to hell. Hell is hot. And we grew up in church. They talk, they talk about hell being hot, but they talk about it a lot. <laughs> And I started, to, I started talking about how when you make excuses, you excuse now, you know, some of y'all, you, you're sleeping with your girlfriend and you're making excuses, you know, you know get, pick up your cross. You can't get in the back seat of a car with a cruel cross on your back and you're, you're drinking and listening to rock and roll music, you know, all this stuff, you know, and I was doing all this stuff. And, and I, I told him what I said, I said, excuses are where dreams go to die. Now, some of that might have been true. <laughs> But the more I look at this text, the older I've gotten, I don't think he was making excuses. I think he was giving reasons. H have you noticed like when, when somebody tells you something to do, you have reasons. If you tell somebody else to do, they have excuses. 
Okay, we ain't going to talk about how you judge others and not yourself. But anyway, it, that's free. That's free if you want to judge others by their, uh, by their motives and judge yourself by your intentions. You just keep doing that. That's not even part of the sermon. You just keep doing that to your family and ruining your marriage like that. But anyway, anyway, it's not a marriage sermon. We don't want to talk about that today. I just want to say that if, when you deal with something for 38 years, it can feel helpless. And everything he said was true. Everything he said was true. I used to think this dude is so lazy. Man, this brother is so lazy. Jesus coming by talking about when you want to get well. I got all these excuses. This dude is so lazy. And then I read the text again this week. That brother is paralyzed. How a preacher like me going to be like, get in the pool, boy? And he's like, I'm paralyzed. I mean, who is yelling at a paralyzed man? Come on, man. I mean, who, is, who wants to go to the hospital right now, walk down to the paralyzed room and talk about, hey, you bunch of lazy bums, get out of your beds. <laughs> How stupid was I? Lord, why did they give me a microphone? <laughs> I mean, in fact, when I look at it, I thought he was lazy and wasn't even trying. He, he says in the text, he says, I'm trying, number one. He's at the pool, not at his house, throwing a pity party for himself. Oh, he's at, he's at the pool. In fact, he knows the way this works. And then when he says this, he says this, I'm trying, verse 7, verse 7, sir, the invalid replied. He's an invalid, Pastor Todd. Don't be making fun of the invalids, you know, about being lazy, right? The sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me uh, when, when the water is stirred. While I'm trying... He's trying. In fact, he tried for 38 years, and some of us in this room and watching online won't try for 38 minutes. Oh, I'm caught. Yeah, we're going to have a bunch of room next week. He mean. No, I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to, I, I'm amazed at the number of people in this church that want a breakthrough but are unwilling to press through. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the number of people that are desperate for change in their life but won't go get good godly counselor in their life. I'm amazed at the number of people who have a, 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 an overarching issue, a battle with whatever, and won't go read a book by a good Christian author on the topic. I'm amazed how we can have altar call after altar call after altar call in this church, and you sit there and your heart about to beat out of your chest, knowing you need and you will not come and receive prayer from some. I am amazed. I'm amazed. 38 years. Helpless, powerless. Maybe that's what, maybe that's what drew Jesus to the man. Because uh, God loves helpless people. I never thought about it before this week, but he was faithful. He'd been showing up at that pool for 38 years. Yes. Faithful. I'm telling you right now, faith honors God and God honors faith. If he wasn't faithful to show up at the pool every day, believing that God, who stirred the water, was going to heal them, he wouldn't have been there the day Jesus showed up. When I tell people all the time, well, I'll read my Bible, I won't get anything out of it, don't come to church, don't. You never know the day that you come that God will show up and he'll intersect your need with his omnipotent power and his, 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 his grace and his wisdom. You never know what that means. So here's the deal. I, I, I don't know if you're thinking about quitting or walking away, but here's the question you need to ask before you do, have I been faithful? Well, you don't understand why they do. I don't, I don't even talk about they right now. Ask yourself, before you walk away from a marriage, before you quit a job, without having another job, need that, that's free too. Before you quit your job, ask how I've been faithful. Before you run your boss down, ask how I've been faithful. Before you leave a church, whether it's this church or any other church you end up, ask, have I been faithful? Jesus said, do you want to get well? Man, I used to think, what a crazy question. What a, what a ludicrous question. Do, I, do you want to get well? And then I mis, messed around. I've been in senior leadership for over 12 years now, and I started to think, man, that's not such a crazy question after all. Because I wrote it down like this in my notes. Some people are more comfortable with their brokenness than they are interested in finding wholeness. You want to get well? Some people would rather hold on to their pain because if God healed them, you wouldn't have anything to post about. Yeah. 
Some of us in this room, some of us watching online, if you actually allow God to heal you, people wouldn't have pity on you anymore, and you don't know what you would do with that. Well, I've been healed a long time. I've been free a long time. Have you? Because you keep talking about it like you haven't. And here's how you know if you've been set free for something. You refuse to keep bringing it up like it just happened. And I'm going to drive this home because I feel like this is where we are as a church. Some people are more addicted to the attention the brokenness gets us than we are desperate to get a touch from God. St. Augustine, one of the early, early church fathers, said it like this. The life which we are accustomed holds us more than the life that we long for. And I'm not going to normalize your captivity anymore because if I normalize your captivity, you'll never seek freedom. And 38 years is long enough. Some of you have been held captive for 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. And it's time to get free from that thing. Do you want to get well? Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be free? The man said, yes. I, I've tried. I, I would if I could. I've done everything I know to do. But I'm helpless. I don't, I don't have any help. And I want to tell you, do you feel helpless? You tried everything you know to try. You tried the steps, and you've tried to write the letter, and you've tried to do the thing, and you've went to the class, and you've got the counsel. I want to tell you, you are maybe feel helpless or powerless, but you are not hopeless. In fact, when everybody says, don't get your hopes up, I want you to hear, keep your hopes up. Just keep, you never know when God's going to show up with power and authority. Keep your, I haven't seen God move in 38 years. I don't care. Keep your hopes up. Paul sitting in prison for years. Keep your hopes up. Why? Because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Keep your hopes up. Why? Because my hope is not in an outcome. My hope is in a savior. My hope is in the cross. My hope is in his power. My hope is in his strength. And even if he won't deliver me, he will strengthen me to get me through it. Do you want to be well? Number three, number three, do you want to be well? It may be unbelievable, but it's not impossible. Impossible is what God does best. If you want to write... If you want God to write an amazing story with your life, you better get ready for the impossible. You better get comfortable in the unbelievable. Now, if you want to live in a neat, weak, anemic, casual Christian life, this, this last section is not even for you. But if you really, if you want God to write an amazing story with your life, you'll have an only God moment. You will. Had somebody come by and look at the building the other week, and it's great, it's awesome, love it. They said, man, you, you built a great church. I said, whoa, I, I ain't built nothing. Microphone, I'm good. Hammer, bad, all right? I said, no, nah, I, I, didn't, I didn't build this. God did. In fact, at our dedication service, I'm going to honor some of our, our team because the team built it. I'm telling you, I didn't build it. I didn't build it. We had a team that built it. But I guarantee if you go ask one of these team members that spent on site for the last six months, and you say, man, you did a, you did a great job. You built the building. They would say, oh, whoa, whoa, I, I didn't build it. Only God. And everybody I know that has walked through great tragedy, or great obstacles, or overcome great odds, and they follow Jesus when somebody says, man, you're so successful. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Only God. Oh, man, you're, you're so strong. <laughs> Only God. Only God. And it's unbelievable, but it is not impossible. Look at the text. Then Jesus said to him, come on, say it with me. One, two, three. Get, get up. I'm reading this text and I'm thinking, how insensitive is Jesus? He's as bad as I was when I was you, Pastor. Jesus, how are you going to tell a paralyzed man to get up? 
oh, insensitive Jesus. And I thought, if I was the man on the mat and Jesus said to him, get up, I, and this is where I, I thought, I would have thought, I would if I could. I would if I could. Last uh, Sunday, we ended this service in the garden and uh, the disciples were asleep and Jesus came back to the disciples and said, why are you sleeping? Get up. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? And I was losing my mind, Brian. I was like, I get up. Get up from your anxiety. Get up from your fear. I'm going to all, all cost on them, man. I'm going to Pentecostal. I was like, get up under the authority. Get up. I was sitting in my office this week and I was writing this sermon. I was wondering how many of you thought, I would if I could. But Pastor, I've tried everything I know to try. I've done everything I know to do. And see, none of, none of Jesus' miracles are standalone. They all point to a, a greater story. This is a picture of your salvation. Let me give you a little theological thing. He couldn't do it, and you can't save yourself either. He needed outside power and authority to do it. And your weakness is where God's power is most evident. And it's when you encounter his power and authority that the unbelievable, I'm telling you, there are people who serve in this church and you walk in and somebody from your past walks in and they're like, you, you serve here, you work here, you go here. And you're like, yeah, I know it's unbelievable, but it's not impossible. I mean, you mean, you mean you have been addi addiction free for 10 years. I know, I know it's unbelievable, but it's not impossible. I mean, you get to sing on a stage, you get to play an instrument for God. I know, I know, I know it's unbelievable, but it is not impossible. When Jesus says get up, he doesn't take the man to the water. This is only by the power of Jesus. He doesn't take, no, no, he speaks with power and authority. And when Jesus says get up, then we should match his instruction with our obedience and get up. When Jesus says get up, that means power is available. When Jesus says get up, that means things change. That's when Jesus says get up, that means you're on the edge of the impossible. So let me ask you, do you want to get well? Do you? Then get up. Get up. get well you're watching online you, oh man I'm telling you something's happening in this church if you're watching online you want to get well if it's your house I want you to stand up If you're in a coffee shop, just stand up. People's going to think I'm weird. You are. Stand up. Because when Jesus speaks with power and authority, the impossible becomes possible. Well, thank you so much for joining us online today. If this message impacted you and you have a story to share, let us know. Email us at amen at anchorpoint.tv. Also, maybe you have a prayer request. We would love to pray with you. You can email that prayer request to care at anchorpoint.tv. And don't forget, you can join us online live every Sunday at 10 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I hope to see you there.